Greetings, ladies and mentalgents, and welcome to this narration of the book, Introduction to Human Biology, taken from Reddit. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 5 Jean-Francois made his way out of the provisions room, wondering where he could find the equipment to a stove on the space station. The provisioner was right in a way. Starting a fire on a station would not likely be a bad idea, but John was too incensed at the time to realize. As he stalked the halls of the space station, he began talking aloud to himself. All right, sir, so we're on the station, the aliens don't cook, and I can't start a fire either. I need something warm, maybe more hot than warm. What if, um, they have some kind of system powering everything in here? Does he use electricity? That'd be a reasonable assumption. We're in space, so we need something to heat her to keep us warm. I, I don't feel any warm air coming out of the vents, but there must be something that regulates the temperature. Two aliens doing maintenance on a panel turned as Jean-Francois spoke and gave him the strangest look. He realized that he likely looked sunny around like this while talking to himself. But he was a man on a mission, so uh, damn the optics. Once out of earshot of the human, they whispered to each other, Oh, that? Never seen a species like that before. Must be one of the new ones they sent to the memo about the uh, human. They are peculiar. We, we should probably steer clear of their way. The other nodded, returning to his work. Jean-Francois continued looking for all possible rooms and corridors for a location that could have what he needed. Soon, he came upon a sign outside of a door that he didn't recognize. It looked like some kind of reactor. Curious, we went inside. Multiple machines seemed to hum as they did their work. Tubes with glowing liquid went from the machines into the others, forming a complex array, all in precocious harmony. Higher up on the walls, large panels could be seen holding some computer-like systems that flashed with multitude of lights, all with alien text scrolling down the screens that appeared to be monitors. A few barriers were also present, surrounding some of the equipment, and Jean-Francois noticed some visual cues that would indicate some kind of hazard, but could not decipher the symbols. A loud alien voice spoke out with some authority behind him. Hey, you can't be in here. Authorized personnel only. Jean-Francois turned to the right and found a frustrated alien. It was slightly shorter than he was, perhaps 140 centimeters tall, and looked like a crossbreed between a jellyfish and a scorpion. A dozen or so tentacle-like appendages stripped down from its head, which was where the stinger would have been, and seemed to behave as arms while the rest of its body was supported by a large base featuring six legs. Oh, uh, hey, um, what is this place? You are in engineering, Station Cruoli. We've got things to do here. He figured he might as well ask the alien for some help. Hey, look, quick question. I need some kind of flat metal plate that can radiate heat. I need to cook my food. It looked at him with some mix of disgust and apprehension. Why would you possibly need that? We don't eat raw food, at least not consistently. Breaking it down by cooking it allows us to more efficiently process the nutrients. It also tastes like a hundred times better. The gears were turning in the alien's head, clearly seeing some potential to this idea. Interesting. You must be one of the new arrivals with spark potential. Yeah, um, we got you a little more than a day ago. Uh, what do you mean by spark potential? Y'all species must know the spark if you are found worthy enough to be bring here, no? It's a special gift that can arise from any of us. It lets us expand our horizons, create, invent. Well, uh, that's a long definition for intelligence, thought Jean-Francois. You mean, uh... Intelligence? No, it's, um, different. Every person aboard the station can be considered intelligent, but not many of them could come up with a, a concept for the space station, for example, or uh, a cooking idea. Uh, so, like intelligence, but different. Imagining new concepts, so, um, a bit like creativity. The alien's word lit up with an expression of motions as it motioned over the word. Yes, the spark! I knew your species must have had a word for it. Very well, let me check to see if I can provide you with something for your project. Uh, don't touch anything. The alien left before Jean-Francois could continue the interesting conversation that he was drawn into. 
It seemed like creativity was something that was rare, occurring only every so often in other species. It explained the lack of ideas and strategy that were displayed during the class that they took, and in some ways, the lack of conking. This whole academy, then, was merely a tool, or rather an experiment designed to scout those with creativity in order to hasten their progress. The thought crossed his mind to try and explain that creativity is something inherent in every human, but he wondered how it would be perceived by different species. Before he could spend more time on the subject, the alien returned with something for him. This is uh, what we use to heat up sections of the station. You see this little bar on the outside? Push it upwards to increase the heat and downwards to lower it. Usually we keep the station at 14 degrees Celsius, as it is the optimal temperature for most species. Not too hot for those who prefer colder climates, and those who prefer a warmed one can simply dress up a bit. Don't use this so much that you change the temperature elsewhere. Okay. Well, keep that in mind. It's only for a few minutes at a time. This is powered by a battery. Good guess, but no. Otherwise, everything would need batteries. Instead, we use inductive coupling to wirelessly transmit power to every device in the station. Wow. Amazing. Say, um, what do you do here? I'm the chief engineer. You may call me Scotty. No, I do really need you to go. Jean Francois thanked Scotty for his help and returned to his room to attempt cooking. At the other end of the station, Lucerna was looking forward to a good meal as she left Mr. Florge's class. The first encounter she had with these humans was interesting, but her hunger came first. Thankfully, her species received two servings worth twice a day. She picked up her meat, drawing a few sideways stares from the other students, some of envy from the other carnivals and others of disgust from the herbivores. As she was getting ready to go to her room, she saw the humans leave the class and go in a line. She decided to wait to see what they would choose. She read that they were omnivores, often seeing mention of meats like bacon and their internet, but they didn't exactly fit the profile of a species that ate meat. After all, they had no natural weapons to catch prey. She witnessed quite the outrage when they reached the front of the, one of the humans, raising his voice and acting rather hostile. To her surprise, it was the one who seemed so meek when she confronted him that initiated that disagreement. He ended up taking both offerings and the other three opted for vegetables and fruits. After getting their food, they split up, much to Lusona's confusion. The other three seemed as confused as her, looking around trying to find who knows what. This could be a good chance to approach them, get to know them a bit better. The humans were talking to each other as she began walking towards them. Spotting her out of the corner of their eyes, they turned to look at the increasingly large shade of red that was getting nearer. Barry was the first to speak up. Hey, is it me or is that big red lizard approaching us? Nizumi weighed in on the observation and corrected him. Lizard, um, I'd say that it's more like a, uh, a dragon. How? Oh, a dragon? Lasoda was standing upright in full view of them, her red scales glistening under the station's ambient lights. Her scale varied slightly, going from crimson to lighter shades of red and spots. The scale stopped as they reached the front of her torso, a thick beige leathery material covering her exposed underbelly instead. On her head, a slightly larger horn than the two above her ears stood out between her two nostrils, Twin wings were kept close behind her, their tips barely poking atop her shoulders. They seemed rather small to propel a creature the size of that into the air, however. Lastly, contrary to mythological dragons from Earth, her neck seemed to be of a more reasonable proportion. Hello, humans. Are you lost? Barry looked at her from top to bottom as she replied, taking in the eight feet of her, Oh, we're just wondering where the cafeteria is. Common place where people eat. You won't find that here. You traumatize the poor herbivores if you place them next to carnivores while they ate. Best to use your quarters for that. Is eating with others a human thing? Oh, um, okay. Uh, sort of, I guess. I mean, uh, some people eat alone, but uh, many use lunch as a way to socialize or as a replacement for a meeting. Metal meal of cycle. Interesting. You even have specific words for every time you consume food. If you're going to eat somewhere together, 
Mind if I join you? Simultaneously, all the three looked at each other with some skepticism, unsure of what to think about the idea. Barry started a bit, and Azumi decided for the group, Well, I suppose so. We should get to learn about our fellow students. Good, sounds good. Um, uh, let's go to, go to my room then, uh, offered Barry. Laura and Azumi shot each other a look that said a thousand words. No thanks, uh, let's go to mine. They made their way, following Laura and drawing quite the few funny looks. Seeing Lysona follow them, all now present in Laura's room, which she had kept immaculately clean. They began eating. A single large vegetable and what appeared to be a handful of fruit looked all right for consumption, and so they dug in, still wishing that it was cooked, but willing to give it a try. The single vegetable seemed rather dense, packing more weight than its size would normally suggest, with an appearance similar to that of a large orange potato. They took a small bite, checking for taste and consistency. You know, that kind of reminds me of a cucumber, said Barry. Maybe, um, uh, for texture, but the taste is more like acidic, like some kind of tomato, replied Laura. They carefully savoring the alien food was interrupted by a loud slurping and chewing noises, turning over to Lasona, who had made short work of her meat. It was then that they understood what she had meant earlier by making her bavols uncomfortable. Trying to wash away the gory details from her mind, Izumi broke into ice with a question. So, would you say that your species are dragons? Questioned Azumi. Her tongue licks her mouth were all traces of meat that she just ate, making sure that she lost none of its flavorful droplets. Her forked tongue seems to mesmerize Barry, who stopped eating to simply observe her. Hmm. Your word dragon does translate into a specific characteristics that it would describe one of us, but it is not our given name, no. We are called the Dwaydun. Mizumi continued her line of questioning. How is it then that we have descriptions of your species from such a long time before we ever met you? Laura jumped in, also curious at the whole situation. Yeah, what about fire breathing and wealth holding, all the dragon myths? Well, uh, we can't breathe fire for one. We do tend to hold things. It's a byproduct of something in our brains that makes us want to stay sitting on something in order to prepare us for covering our eggs. The process takes many years, so it's hardwired into us. Before you ask, no, we can't really fly. At least, not in most worlds. The gravity and atmosphere just has to be right. I will admit, however, that I am exceedingly curious as to the coincidence of all of this. Nothing in my people's history describes humans, but it is too much of a chance that you just happen to invent Waden. Yeah, I will try and investigate this when I can. I was actually hoping you knew of something that could help me a bit. The rest of the meal continued much the same way, sharing small bits of information about the academy in regular conversation. After a few minutes, Lissona's electronic device emitted a small noise. Oh, we should get ready for class. The break period is almost over. All three reached out for their own device, confirming the schedule and the class location. Oh... By the way, a few of us are heading over to the recreation facility afterwards. Would you want to join? Added Lasona, as she stood up at her head for the door. Is it some kind of sport? Inquired Laura. I guess you could say it's physical activity related, y yes. All three looked at each other and smiled. It had been too long since they got it to properly stretch. Hey, I wonder if John Francois had time to eat mentioned Barry offhandedly as they all walked for Laura's room. End of chapter. Just a quick shout out to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Cat Crab Lobster, Data Magnet, Duck Machine, Bezik, Try Again 95, Feudic Yol, Astrea the Dreamer, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Athelia, Meridian 117, and Jordan Buxmorm. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one and I'll see you next time. Cheers.